Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm an alcoholic. My name is Yisra. I'm a member of the Mediterranean Group. We meet here in Jerusalem, Israel, which is where I'm coming to you from uh, every uh, Wednesday evening at 9 p.m. That's 2 p.m. local time for you. You're more than welcome to join. We'd love to have you. Um, <clears throat> I'll put the, the information in the chat at the end of the meeting. I have a sobriety date. Uh, that is the 14th of February, 1980. I celebrated 41 years of continuous sobriety two weeks ago today. Um, I uh, thank you. Thank you. It's not, it's, I, I don't, I don't believe it's not me. I mean, it's, I, I, it's not only me, it's uh, my will aligned with the will of a power greater than myself. That's for sure. I certainly wasn't incapable of, of uh, one day of sobriety when I got here. So uh, I certainly wasn't going to run a streak like 41 years without uh, the help of a power greater than myself as experienced through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and my continued participation in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, but I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself already. That is uh, what happens. Um, I want to thank Matt for the invitation to be here. Um, thank you. Uh, I've heard a lot about your group. Um, I guess I don't rank to share on the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's a good dog and pony show for a Sunday afternoon. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I'm not really kidding. I'm kind of kidding. Anyway, I'll stop. Um, I... I uh, I picked up my first drink when I was nine years old. I waited. I could have used a drink on the way to kindergarten or any other day of my entire life before I picked up a drink. I have a friend who likes to quote me saying that I was sober when I started drinking. In fact, I started drinking because I was sober. And that's important for me to remember. I drank as a solution. I didn't pick up my first drink as a solution because I didn't know what alcohol was. But once I experienced alcohol, I knew that I had found a solution for my life. And my life was the causes and conditions that we talk about in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The underlying causes and conditions that I, I addressed with alcohol. And it's important to remember because by the time I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, alcohol had become the problem. And so it seemed like stopping drinking was taking care of the problem, but it wasn't taking care of the problem. It was taking care of the solution. And that's important for me to remember too, because when I stop drinking, I am left without a solution for the causes and conditions of my life. And what I'm talking about essentially is what Dr. Silkworth talked about, uh, not Dr. Silkworth, what Dr. Carl Jung talked about when he wrote to Bill Wilson in 1961, referring back to Roland Hazard, who was the man who, of course, I know you all know, but I'll tell you anyway. The man who brought the message to Ebby, who was the man who brought the message to Bill. Bill, of course, brought the message to Bob, and we had Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know why we didn't have Alcoholics Anonymous when Ebby brought the message to Bill or when Roland brought the message to Ebby, but we didn't. Dr. Young wrote of Roland Hazard, he said that his craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness, expressed in medieval language, the union with God. He said that Roland drank for a spiritual experience, that the alcohol was a spiritual experience. In case Bill didn't get that, he finished the letter by saying, you see, alcohol in Latin is spiritus. And you use the same word for the highest religious experience as well as the most depraving poison. The helpful formula, therefore, is spiritus contra spiritum. So when I stop drinking, I am left without a solution as well as being left without a problem. And I need another solution. Anyway, 
let me back up a little and 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 tell you that I'm an alcoholic. Um, I picked up my first drink when I was nine. It was a Carling Black Label beer. My cousin was a liar, a cheat, and a thief. Uh, he would want me to tell you he didn't rob people. He robbed people who robbed people. He would want me to point out that distinction. Um, and one night they stole a case of whiskey and a couple cases of Carling Black Label beer. They told me I could be the bartender. I was nine. They were 13, 14 years old. I could open up everybody's beer and take a sip. I realized if you're only allowed one sip, take a big sip. And I was off to the races. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I can't tell you for sure if fear, anxiety, and self-obsession can be transferred through breast milk. But if it can, it was in my case. I was anxious, afraid, and self-centered from my earliest memories. I had hyper focus on things you had that I didn't or things that I had that you didn't, that I didn't want to have. I was super aware of my around surroundings and I drank that alcohol and it was like that guided meditation. It was like the golden light. It filled me from the tips of my toes to the top of my head, pushing out fear, anxiety, selfishness, and filling me with strength, power, and courage. And I was nine years old. I stand before you for, I'm not standing, I'm sitting, but if I were standing, I would be five, eight, five, nine, five, eight inches tall. And when I was nine, I was a lot shorter, but I have a memory of walking up to a grown man, putting my arm around his shoulder and looking him in the eye and saying, get bent. Now, I don't know what that means today, but it was the spirit. It was the spirit to, to look a man in the eye and say, get bent. That's what alcohol did for me. The next time I drank, I drank 16 Genesee cream ales. Dolores, my friend Matt's older sister, whose party we were crashing, came up to me about halfway through the night and she said, stop drinking now. You are as drunk as you're going to get. You can't get physically any drunker. Your body can't process alcohol any faster. All you're going to do if you continue to drink is ruin tomorrow. Okay. I have always, drunk or sober, been willing to ruin tomorrow in the hopes of making tonight just a little bit better which is why I think it was Father Tom Weston that used to say, and I'll give it to you now, it's just a, just a free gift. It's just good information for an alcoholic to have. If it's after 11 o'clock at night and it sounds like a good idea, don't do it. <laughs> anyway, the next time I drank, we drank monkey brew. Everybody stole something with alcohol in it. We mixed it all together in a jar. We were drinking vodka, gin, bourbon, beer, wine, and champagne. It had foam. The foam was purple. And I swear to you, it swirled in the glass while it sat on the table like a scientist's potion. We drank that and we went to an eighth grade dance at the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary School. And my best friend, Matt, threw up on a nun. It wasn't a spiritual experience for her, but it was for us incredibly freeing to throw up on a nun. Anyway, now I know you see an Orthodox Jew sitting in front of you, and I want you to understand this was not interfaith warfare. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous as an Irish-Italian Catholic kid from Philadelphia. I sit before you, an Orthodox Jew living in Jerusalem. I'm not saying that if you work the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, you'll end up an Orthodox Jew. I'm just saying it has happened. So be careful. You know, we all fear a lot of things that God is going to do when we turn our will and life over to the care of God. And all I'm saying is this is one of the things that has actually happened. Okay. That's the way I drank. I want to say one more thing about my drinking, and then I want to get sober. We used to steal my friend Brink's car. We stole his, his mother's car. We only stole it because none of us were old enough to drive. And every Friday afternoon, we would drive down into West Philadelphia, which was the equivalent of the Bronx. And uh, we would buy a case of Carling Black, um, not Carling Black, Colt 45 malt liquor. And we'd throw that case of beer in the trunk. And eight of those would be for me, eight would be for Brink, and eight would be for Johnny Cargan. And I felt better as soon as that beer was in the trunk. 
As soon as I knew I had access to alcohol, alcohol made me feel better. That's how powerful alcohol was for me. And that's how I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. There's 197 people in this room, and I bet 180 of you have rougher, tougher stories than I do. And I want to say the following. I have hung my hat, my alcoholism hat, on the idea that is referred to in the third chapter, where it says the idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. I believe the abnormal drinker that Bill is talking about is the very same real alcoholic that he's referring to at the top of the page. I am of the opinion, and I may be the only one of this opinion in Alcoholics Anonymous, that we use the club called Real Alcoholic to push people out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe we beat people with the idea are you a real alcoholic? A real, I'm a real alcoholic. Are you a real alcoholic? I'm a real alcoholic. I want to say something about alcoholism. From the time of Noah, you know the guy with the boat, right? Noah built the boat about 3,500 to 5,000 years ago. I'm not asking for religious belief in the story of Noah. I'm just saying it's a really old story. And the story goes like this. Noah's minding his own business, and God says, build a boat and save the world, which sounds like a lot. And Noah does it. He builds a boat, and he saves the world. And you know the very first thing Noah does when he gets back from saving the world? He plants a vineyard, and he gets drunk and naked in front of the kids. Now, you might say to me, Yisrael, that's just a heavy drinker. Given sufficient reason, Noah could perhaps stop drinking. We'll never know, will we? The reason I know Noah's a real alcoholic is because you know who Noah blamed for getting naked in front of the kids? The kids. He cursed the children for seeing his nakedness. If that's not a resentment gone awry, I don't know what is. So in my book, and I'm the speaker this week, Noah was an alcoholic. From Noah till today, a period of somewhere between 3,500 and 5,000 years ago, there's been a solution for our problem for 85 years years. And even still, the vast majority of alcoholics will die of alcoholism, which is a horrible, humiliating, disgusting, shameful, embarrassing, detrimental, not only to the alcoholic, but to our friend Sharon C., who perhaps you've had speak here, likes to say that when an alcoholic goes to sleep sober, 10 people sleep better. Well, that means when an alcoholic goes to sleep drunk, 10 people sleep worse. So if Sharon's right, a lot of people suffer when an alcoholic dies an alcoholic death. And to this day, despite our tremendous success against the disease of alcoholism, the vast majority of alcoholics still die of alcoholism without ever having darkened the doorway of an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And of those who come here, and I'm not asking for statistics. I don't want the statistics from the first uh, forwards. I, I don't care about statistics. A lot of people that come here don't stay. It's hard to stay here. Don't make it any more difficult than it has to be. The person that comes will make it hard enough. I don't know if you're familiar with the internet or Facebook. The, the Facebook says fairly conclusively that Alcoholics Anonymous is dying. It might be dead by the end of the day. It might die before this meeting ends. That's what the Facebook says. I'm here to say that the Alcoholics Anonymous is not dying. I don't care what the Facebook says. Alcoholics Anonymous is alive and well. I know that because I'm sitting in a meeting called the Bronx Big Book Study. I have a big book. And as long as I have a big book, Alcoholics Anonymous will not die. I will promise you that tonight. So we're not dying. 
and we're strong. We're powerful. God is everything, my friends. And if God is everything, all the non-alcoholics in the world, all the heavy drinkers in the world can come to Alcoholics Anonymous and not dilute it by one speck. Because there are also alcoholics here. There are also readers and believers and practitioners of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous and all the other conference-approved literature. There are those who believe and carry on the traditions of those who went before them. I don't know your legacy, but I know my legacy. And I will continue to carry forth my legacy and that alone. And I'm no superstar. I'm just one guy. But that alone will stop Alcoholics Anonymous from disappearing. God is everything. And if God is everything and what is true in the book is true, it can't be destroyed. Not by, and, and I want to tell you one the other thing, and then I'll move on. I, I know I'm on a bit of a soapbox right now. One more thing. I've known a few alcoholics, not that many, but a few. Not a one of them has any interest zero in Alcoholics Anonymous. They don't want to belong. They don't want to attend meetings. Every once in a while, they'll come out to hear me share. They don't think it's so much fun or so great. That they're just not impressed. So that's what I want to say. Uh, and I'll, I'll move on. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, as I said, in early February of 1980. Something happened when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. I sat in the clubhouse that I thought was Alcoholics Anonymous because that's where the phone that had said Alcoholics Anonymous in the phone book had rung. I sat there all afternoon and I met a bunch of people. Everyone did basically the same thing. They shook my hand. They sat and they told me a little bit about themselves and their alcoholism. They gave me a card that said, their name, their number, and most of them wrote call anytime. They shook my hand, they gave me the card, and they said, you feel free to call me anytime. And I'm convinced that they did that, and I do that for the very same reason. One, I know they're never going to call. It is safe to say call anytime. That's why I drank, so I wouldn't have to call a complete stranger in the middle of the night and say what, I'm afraid? One guy took my number. I stayed that entire day. I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that night. I have no memory of that meeting. I had gone there because my friend Lizanne had gotten sober and I had noticed a change in her eyes. Later that night at the end of that meeting, her older brother George gave me a ride home. He told me that in order to stay sober, I should get rid of the radio I was carrying and get a haircut. Now, it's important to read the book because neither of those suggestions are in the book. You can listen to whatever kind of music you want and your hair can be as short or as long as you want. It's not in the book. Anyway, one guy took my number. In the middle of the next afternoon, my phone rang. And he said, hey, Chris, how are you? And I said, oh, I'm all right. I was a little, a little, who is this guy and what's he doing? And he said, how'd you like to go to a meeting tonight? And I said, yes, because that's what I say. But what I really was thinking was, Paul, I went to AA yesterday. You mean I got to go to AA two days in a row? That was a little much, I thought, a little. I didn't want to rush into anything. But I went to that meeting, and I sat there. It was a beginner's meeting of the Paoli Young People's Group. And everyone went around that room and introduced themselves as an alcoholic. And I didn't know if I was an alcoholic or not. I didn't, certainly didn't know if I was a real alcoholic. I didn't know if I had a peculiar mental twist. I didn't know if I had a, you know, a, a physical allergy. And a, I didn't know about the phenomenon of craving. I didn't know about Bill or Bob or Evie. Or, I didn't know if God was everything or God was nothing. I didn't know nothing about nothing. And thank God nobody asked me. I didn't have to pass the test. I sat there, and Paul must have noticed how uncomfortable I was because he was the second to last person. I was going to be the last person to introduce myself, and he simply said, my name is Paul, and I said, my name is Chris, and that's how I went that day, and by the end of that meeting, one hour later, I was running around the room saying, if you're alcoholic, then I'm alcoholic. If what is wrong with you is what is wrong with me, then I have alcoholism. Because what you had done for that hour is exactly what Bill Wilson had done with Bob Smith in May of 1935. 
You told me about yourselves. You told me how you were alcoholic and what that meant to you and how you felt and how you acted and how you responded to life. And based on what you said about yourself, I realized that if you were alcoholic, I was alcoholic because I responded to life and reacted the same exact way you did. And believe me, in my family, if you come through the mental illnesses with alcoholism, you're doing very well. In, in really, in my family, I come from a long line of crazy people. In my family, having alcoholism is like going to Harvard. You're doing quite well. Anyway, Paul became my sponsor, and he took me, started taking me to a bunch of meetings. We started talking every day, and we started looking at the, the steps, and, uh, and we started down this path, you know? And uh, we did that every day for many months. And then one day he said, yeah, at the end of every conversation, he used to say, don't drink and go to meetings. And I would say, yeah, amen. You know, I, I was so glad I got the smart one. I, I saw there were some dummies around here and I'd really gotten one of the one of the highest level functioning sponsors that I could have found because he was perfect for me. Is what I'm cutely saying. And then one day he said, don't drink, go to meetings and pray. And I stopped calling. I stayed active in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I didn't call nearly as much. And I know we do that. I know I have guys that do that, too. Stay in the game. Stay in the game. I don't know who said this before the meeting, and so I'm not calling out anyone in particular. I really, 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 really do not know who said this. But someone said, I'm glad to be here and not at one of those gobbledygook meetings. I'm going to ask you to do something whoever said that. And, and I know that we all have those moments. I'm going to ask you to set aside everything you think about, everything you think you know about meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous that don't fit your particular criteria of what makes a good meeting. Because I'm not God. And I don't know what works for someone else. I only know what works for me. And what I have to do is find what works for me and not denigrate what something what clearly works for someone else or no one would be attending that meeting. That's how meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous die. People stop attending them. And when they do, there's no one there to take the commitments. There's no one there to pay the rent. There's no one there to turn the lights on. And the meeting stops existing. If people are showing up for that meeting, I promise you, Clancy Immislin was my sponsor. I was a member of the Pacific Group, the Atlantic Group, and I started the Mediterranean Group. I promise you, there are people who think I go to gobbledygook cultist AA. They wouldn't for a minute follow in my footsteps. And that's okay. That's fine. I'm not right, and they're not wrong. Alcoholics Anonymous has many manifestations, as God has many manifestations, as the steps have many interpretations. I only have to do it in a way that works for me, and I only have to take people through the steps in the way that worked for me, because that's the authentic way for me to do it. And how someone else does it is none of my business unless they come to me and ask to do it my way and then if they want to fight every step of the way because this isn't the way they use then that's a different story but if someone is off across town having a successful meeting it's none of my business how it works why it works if it works my the anonymity of this 12th tradition, as I understand it, is to place the principle before the personality. The personality is the thought that I think I, that they're doing it wrong, that they're not serious, that they're, they're half-assing it, that they're duffers, that they're socialites, that they're talking about therapy and this and that. You know what? For all our denigration of treatment centers, all of the early members of Alcoholics Anonymous were hospitalized. All of them. Every single one of them. I don't know what's best. And I, don't, I only know what I do. And I only want to know what I do. And I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to be in a meeting called a big book study. I know it's speaker day. 
you meet six days a week, seven days a week, and six of them, you study the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I find that compelling too. So I'm honored and 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 privileged to be here, but I'm privileged to be in any meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous because I don't know who else is there and I don't know who else needs to hear what is being said there. And I don't, I don't pretend to think, I do pretend to think, and that's why I'm talking about it, that I know what's best for everybody. That I, you know, you're not comfortable with the gender of the book, get used to it. Why? Just because I'm used to it? And it's, it's, it's not none of my business. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me over and over and over again. That's what the process of the steps has brought to me. I am powerless and my life is unmanageable. I came to believe in a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity. That is not, that isn't something that happened in 1980 and doesn't happen over and over and over again. It happened this morning. It happened this afternoon when my alcoholism burst forth onto the stage. When, when my when my kids were, it's a holiday here in Jerusalem. It's a holiday. It's a one day holiday that's been going on for three days. I don't have time to explain to you why it's I'm done already. And, and we had a plan to have a meal at one thirty, and nobody was here at one thirty. And on top of that, I hadn't prepared the stuff that I would have had prepared by one thirty. So I freaked out and screamed and yelled at everyone. That's my alcoholism. That's, I didn't drink. I didn't think about drinking. I acted like a jackass and I made everybody uncomfortable and I made my daughter cry. Congratulations. Happy holidays. Right? So I didn't drink. Is that what, so, so do I get a prize for not drinking? No, I have alcoholism today. I haven't had a drink in 40 years. I was 16 when I got here. I had drank for seven years. I've been sober like six times as long as I drank. I've been sober almost three times as long as I was alive when I got here. But I have alcoholism today. Because my alcoholism doesn't manifest in alcohol. It never did. Alcohol was the solution. It manifests in selfishness and self-centeredness. It manifests in wanting to set the stage and wanting to have people do what I want them to do when I want them to do it. It manifests in me feeling less than and taken advantage of and fearful manifesting selfish behavior in my relationships, which causes people to, to, to lash out. And then I go, what? Come on, I'm cute. Be nice. That's alcoholism. I, I didn't drink because I, I thank God today I have a different solution. But if I don't apply that solution on a daily basis, then I have alcoholism. That's why I don't like the, the recovering recovered debate for the same thing as the real alcoholic. People that say, when people say to me they're recovered from alcoholism, it sounds to me like they don't have alcoholism anymore. And I don't know if that's what they mean or not. But what the book clearly tells me on page 85 is that I am not cured of alcoholism. That I have a daily reprieve contingent upon the maintenance of my spiritual condition, the maintenance. I know, I know a lot of people are here because they're sweet and they're kind and they're generous and they follow me around. And I wish I had more different things to say. I say this all the time. It's the maintenance that I'm responsible for, not the spiritual condition. Today, I was not in fit spiritual condition, but it wasn't magical that I wasn't in fit spiritual condition. It's because I wasn't doing the maintenance because I was indulging and feeling like I was being taken advantage of by others, that they were manipulating me and my children and how much time I had with my children and that I should have had more and I should have gotten more 
instead of being grateful for what I had in the moment I had, instead of being in the moment and saying, wow, thank God that we're sitting down for this meal, I flip out. And then you know what? Then we're not sitting down for the meal. Then there's people crying and people wandering around and, and it's, a, it's a mess like that. That's alcoholism, my friends. That's alcoholism. That's where my alcoholism lives today. I wanted to talk one more thing about chapter three because it's, it's become apparent to me that, um, I mean, it's there and it's been there since I got sober and I read it, I'm sure I read it a long time ago. Um, what I'm talking about is the middle of page 33 where it says young people may be encouraged by this man's experience. And this man is that we're speaking about is the man who had some trouble with his drinking and stopped drinking of his own accord for 25 years. He's a guy, he's a prime example of someone that would say, oh, he's a heavy drinker, given sufficient reason, he stopped. Except that when he started drinking again 25 years later, he couldn't stop. And he drank for five years and then died. And you know what? Hey, he can't stop. Death stopped him. Congratulations. I came to Alcoholics Anonymous and I was introduced to a young woman who was five years sober and 21 years old. They introduced me, everyone introduced me, everyone loved to introduce me to Nancy. Have you met Nancy? Have you met Nancy? And Nancy was, she was great. She was 25 years sober. She was beautiful. But she was 21. I was 16. 21 was like 50 to me. I was like, what? 21? I'm, I'll be lucky if I get to 21. Right? And Nancy, and, you know, for years and years and years and years and years and decades, I told this story about Nancy. But I haven't lived in Philly since I was like three years sober, so I don't know what happened to Nancy. And Zoom, the beginning of the Zoom, I'm speaking at a meeting, and suddenly I see in the chat, hi, it's Nancy. And I, and I, I talked to Nancy after the meeting, and she stayed sober for, uh, she stayed sober for, 20, 32 years, I think. I can't even remember right now. I'm so tired. I spoke three times yesterday. That was a mistake in scheduling. Um, but she told me what happened. She came to Alcoholics Anonymous when she was 16. She got sober. She stayed sober for two and a half decades, three decades. And then she lost her husband and her mother and her father in one year. She went to her therapist and she'd fallen away from AA. And that's key. Because she went to her therapist and she said, you know, I don't know. I stopped drinking when I was 17 years old, 16 years old, whatever it was. Maybe I'm not an alcoholic. And you know what her therapist said? Maybe you're not an alcoholic. She took a drink. And she said she knew that very first night that she was alcoholic. And it took nine and a half years to get back. And when I met her at the beginning of Zoom, she was about nine months sober again. And you know what she said to me? It's not as easy the second time. It's not as easy. Now, if you're on your second time or your third time or your 66th time, okay, it's not as easy. That's tough. You got to do it. My sponsor, Clancy Anderson, died this summer with 61 years, 62 years of sobriety. I don't know, maybe 63 or 59, 62 years of sobriety. And he was in AA for nine years before he got one. Nine years. Say there was a guy here that was nine years sober. Say we were all in the same, you know, say we were in the, some church in the Bronx. Say we were all here together and we were here every week. And, and the guy I'm talking about, let's call him Clancy, was here every week and never had any time. Don't you think after nine years, we would think he's a loser? We wouldn't say it. We're good, sober people. But wouldn't we think he's a loser? He's never going to get sober. He's Maybe he's constitutionally capable. Maybe he just doesn't want it. I don't know. But he's... And then one day, he stopped. And he stayed sober for the next 62 years. So we don't know. Just like the meetings that we don't know about. We don't know about the people. That's the anonymity of the 12th tradition. That's the principle for personality. Someone comes up to me and they ask for help. I offer it to them. I tell them, I take them, 
I do with them what I do with people. That's what I do. I try. I try to stay out of the judging department of, uh, 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 you know what I mean. So young people may be encouraged by this man's experience to think that they can stop as he did of their own willpower. We doubt many of them can do it because none of them really want to stop. That's the important first ingredient, actually wanting to. And hardly one of them, because of the peculiar mental twist already acquired, will find he can win out. Several of our crowd, men of 30 or less, have been drinking only a few years, but they found themselves as helpless as those who had been drinking 20 years. If you've acquired this peculiar mental twist and you've only been doing this for a short time, don't feel you have to die or almost die or do this for decades. If you're alcoholic now, you're as alcoholic as you get. Alcoholism doesn't, there's not grades. It's not a continuum. You either are or you aren't. And if you are, and you haven't destroyed your life to the degree that some of these people have, that's okay. You don't get a qualified recovery. You don't get a half recovery for a half case of alcoholism. That doesn't exist. All of God's grace is available to you. All of God's magical mystery is available to you. I have a life beyond my wildest dreams. That's what they offered me. I couldn't have seen this life because it was beyond my wildest dreams. They didn't say you can have your wildest dreams. They said beyond. If I had my wildest dreams, they had said to me right away, early on, you can have whatever you want. I would have a lifetime supply of Marlboro and a 41-year-old Camaro because I would have asked for smokes forever and a brand new Camaro. And I'd be stuck with a 41-year-old car. But they didn't ask. That's not what they said. They said, come on this journey. Take these steps. Manifest these changes. And we don't know where your life will end up. Maybe you'll stay here. Maybe you'll keep going. Maybe you'll go somewhere else entirely. Part of what I want to say as I begin to wrap up is that what I ask for you is to stay active in Alcoholics Anonymous because somebody stopped drinking today or yesterday or will tomorrow and they'll show up in Alcoholics Anonymous and they won't know a goddamn thing about how to do this. And please, God, someone will be here with the experience to show them what they need to do. And, you know, when I got here, it wasn't guys that had gotten sober. It was February of 1980. I wasn't greeted by guys like the lowest rung on the, on the marketing chain. I wasn't greeted by guys with their fingers in the book going, well, let's try this. I wasn't greeted by guys that had gotten sober in January, December, and November of 1979. I was greeted by people who had rich, full lives with decades of sobriety. And they had careers, and they had families, and they still made time to come to Alcoholics Anonymous, to give what was so freely given to them. And they did that, I believe, because that is the tradition of Alcoholics Anonymous. That is what Bill did. That is what Bob did. I mean, think about Bill for a second. Six months of talking to guys and nobody gets sober. Not a one. And then he meets Bob, right? And we have this fateful meeting in Akron, Mother's Day, 1935. Right? And I heard it from his son's mouth. Dr. Bob's son, Smitty, was in that car that day. And he heard his father say to his mother, will give this bird 15 minutes. Because Bob had been talked to about his alcoholism by everybody in his life. He joined the Oxford group to stop drinking. He had shared with them his profoundest fear, was that, which was that he could not stop drinking. 
he knew he was an alcoholic and everyone in his life knew he was an alcoholic. And he said to his wife, we'll give this bird 15 minutes. And he stayed for six hours. And he stayed for six hours, I believe, because Bill didn't talk to Bob about Bob. Everyone else in his life, I would bet, talk to Bob about Bob. Bob, you should stop. Bob, you shouldn't start. That's what Henrietta said. Bob, you shouldn't have one drink. She knew it. He knew it. But he couldn't not drink. Bob, you're a surgeon. Bob, you're a Christian. Bob, you're an Ohioan. Bob, you're a Vermonter. Bob, you shouldn't drink. But Bill didn't talk to Bob about Bob. Bill talked to Bob about Bill. Bill said, this is my story. This is what happened to me. This is how my alcoholism manifested. This is how my recovery manifested. And Bob was transfixed. And Bob began to stay sober. He had a slip a few weeks later, and that's why Alcoholics Anonymous started on June 10th and not on Mother's Day. But from June 10th, the date of his last drink, the two of them stayed sober for the rest of their lives. Permanent sobriety, many would say. Permanent sobriety. Dulled out one day at a time. The upside of that is all we have to deal with is today. The downside of that is today is the only day we get to build our sobriety. In the same way that I can't wake up on Sunday morning and say, hey, you know what? It's going to be a busy week. I'm going to pray all my prayers today for the entire week. It doesn't work that way. Hey, it's going to be a busy week. I'm going to eat all the food I need to eat this week today. It doesn't work that way. Hey, you know what? I'm really, really, really busy. I'm going to spend eight hours at the gym today instead of one hour at the gym each day this week. That's not how life works. There are things which have to be done each and every day, like breathing, like showering for many of us, like sharing gratitude and asking for help and helping someone else and giving this away. I want to just say a couple more things and then wind down and start to wind down. You know, I come to Alcoholics Anonymous to give. That's what I do. Somewhere along the line, you hear people say that this is a selfish program. It's not a selfish program. It's a selfless program. People treat it like therapy. I know now I'm doing exactly what I just said gobbledygook shouldn't do, right? This is what I want to say. Those of us that have manifested the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, worked the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous in our life, and have had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, I believe we are here to give that experience away. Not in arrogance, but in humility. That is the challenge. How do I give the message away in a way that someone wants to hear it? That is my challenge. But that said, it doesn't change the fundamental nature of what I'm doing. I am here to give. Of course I get. I can't help but get. But I'm here to give. In my experience, when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous to get, it's pretty paltry. What there is to get here. It's it's pretty rudimentary. Bill Wilson called it a spiritual kindergarten. I've been here for 41 years. No one would spend 41 years in kindergarten if they were tra- if they were in kindergarten to get. Yes, I get. I get from my sponsor. I get from continued step work. But I'm in a meeting right now of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm surrounded by other alcoholics. I'm here to give. How do I give in such a way that someone is able to take? That's my challenge. That's, you know, I, sure, sure. Be loud, be proud, be, you know, it takes different kinds. I mean, some people, I'm just simply describing how I want to be a giver in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I, I don't, I don't mean to say that, you know, someone calls me up and says, I want to do this, and, and it involves something that I'm not familiar with, I'll say, sure, because I'm here to give. No, 
I, I, I have a specific thing to give and I, I, and I attempt to give it that way. <sighs> That's what I'm here to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to read one more story. Bill Wilson wrote the following story in 19... Where's my page? Here it is. 1957 in the grapevine. He wrote an article called The Greatest Gift of All. The greatest gift that can come to anybody is a spiritual awakening. Without doubt, this would be the certain verdict of how every well-recovered alcoholic in AA's entire fellowship. Okay. Bill sides with the recovered. I side with the recovering. So then what is this spiritual awakening, Bill asks? This transforming experience, those are Dr. Young's words. How can we receive it and what does it do? To begin with, Bill writes, spiritual awakening is our means of finding sobriety. And to us of AA, sobriety means life itself. We know that a spiritual experience is the key to survival from alcoholism, and that for most of us, it is the only key. We must awake or we die. So we do awake, and we are sober. Then what, Bill asks. Is sobriety all we are to expect of a spiritual awakening? We've heard that argument, right? We've heard someone stand up in AA or sit down and speak loudly and say, that's the only thing you get here in AA is sobriety. We don't offer cash. We don't offer prizes. We're not in the relationship business. We're not in the career business. All that we offer is sobriety. The result is a spiritual awakening. Bill writes, again, the voice of AA speaks up. No, Bill writes. Sobriety is only a bare beginning. It is only the first gift of the first awakening. More gifts are to be received. Our awakening has to go on. And if it does go on, we find that bit by bit, we can discard the old life, the one that does not work, that did not work, for a new life that can and does work under any conditions whatsoever. I love that, bit by bit. Not all at once, not with one trip through the steps, not with one good fourth step, not with a great fifth step, bit by bit. Regardless of worldly success or failure, he writes, regardless of pain or joy, regardless of sickness or health, or even of death itself, a new life of endless possibilities can be lived if we are willing to continue our awakening. That is my hope for each and every one of us, that we stay active in Alcoholics Anonymous, that we stay here to give this message away freely as it was given to us, that we offer the freedom we've been given to whoever wants to take it. And that we continue our awakening. That we continue to avail ourselves to a new life of endless possibilities. That might mean being and staying exactly where you are. And it might mean going far afield. It doesn't really matter which. As long as it's your life. That's what I hope the message that I share tonight is. Not that you can have my life, but that you can have your life. We often say when we speak in Alcoholics Anonymous that our job is to tell in a general way what it was like, what happened, and what we're like now. But it says one other thing. It says at the end of page, the, in the middle of page 29, at the end of there is a solution, the second chapter. It says each individual in the personal stories at the back of the book describes in his own language and from his own point of view the way he established his relationship with God. These give a fair cross-section of our membership and a clear-cut idea of what has actually happened in their lives. We hope no one will consider these self-revealing accounts in bad taste. 
Our hope is that many alcoholic men and women desperately in need will see these pages. And we believe it is only by fully disclosing ourselves and our problems that they will be persuaded to say, yes, I am one of them too. I must have this thing. That's what people in Alcoholics Anonymous have done for me for 41 years. Not just at the beginning, but each and every day since. I've walked into a meeting discouraged, down, depressed, fearful, anxious, or ecstatically happy. And one more time, someone has shared their story. And I said, yes, that's me. That's what I need. That's what I am. That's what I have to do. But in order for that to happen, we all have to be here. We all have to stay here. And we all have to share from our hearts. Remember, when this book was written, this book would be sent out to someone in the Bronx from Akron before Bill came back to New York. Say. Or Des Moines or Los Angeles, or Houston, or Austin, or Omaha. And they fully expected someone to read this book and manifest this change and build up a fellowship around them by sharing this message with each other. So those stories in the back of the book were speaker meetings, points of identification, where people would come and they would say, yes, I am one of those two. I must have this thing. So if you're new here tonight, or if you're, you know, I forget who said it, but if you're in your first 30 days of sobriety or your last 30 days of sobriety, I hope you hear this message, not from me or not because of me, but because freedom is available here, freedom from alcohol, freedom from the bondage of self. And whether you're brand new or about to leave, I hope you say, yes. I am one of them too. I must have this thing. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.